Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm so excited to welcome you to today's event with Maisha Cherry, discussing her latest book, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle, in conversation with Jason Reynolds. Today's event is part of Harvard Bookstore's Friday Forum series, which takes place on Friday afternoons during the academic year as a way to highlight scholarly books in a wide range of fields. Though we remain digital for the time being, we have a full schedule of virtual events in the coming weeks as part of this afternoon series and others. On Friday, October 29th, Pat Shipman joins us for a discussion of her latest book, Our Oldest Companions, The Story of the First Dogs, in conversation with Wendy Williams. For today's event, we will conclude with some time for your questions. If you'd like to ask the speaker something, locate the Q&A function wherever it may live on your Zoom display where you can submit all your questions. We'll get through as many as time allows. If you go to the chat function of this presentation, I will shortly be posting a link to our website where you can purchase your copy of The Case for Rage. If you already have a copy or would like to contribute to this series and our store in a different way, I will also be posting in the chat a link to our website's donation function. We greatly appreciate any and all support you were able to extend to us at this time. Please note that closed captioning is available for this broadcast. Depending on which version of Zoom you are using, you may need to enable it yourself simply locate the button marked CC Live Transcript on your display and click through the options. And one final note, as you may know from the large virtual gatherings we've all been attending this past year, technical issues might come up. We do apologize in advance for that. If any technical glitches do occur, we will do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Maisha Cherry is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at the University of California, Riverside. Her books include Unmuted, Conversations on Prejudice, Oppression and Social Justice, and co-edited with Owen Flanagan, The Moral Psychology of Anger. Her work on the role of emotions and attitudes in public life has appeared in The Atlantic, Boston Review, Los Angeles Times, Salon, and New Philosopher Magazine. Today, she is joined in conversation with Jason Reynolds, the award-winning and number one New York Times bestselling author of Miles Morales' Spider-Man, Look Both Ways, and Long Way Down, which received a Newbery honor, a Prince honor, and a Coretta Scott King honor. Jason is the 2020-2021 National Ambassador for Young People Literature. This afternoon, they'll be discussing Professor Cherry's latest book, The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle, a much needed reevaluation of the divisive emotional state that Brandon Terry calls a book to argue with and be transformed by. The Case for Rage introduces to the public one of the most original and distinctive voices in contemporary American philosophy at a time when her thinking and perhaps even anger is sorely needed. Identifying what Professor Cherry calls Lordian rage, the case for rage strips anger and all its synonyms of their negative connotations, critically establishing rage as both necessary and suited to the anti-racist struggles of our times. We are so honored to be hosting this event today. Without further ado, I'm now delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Misha and Jason. Thanks, Ben. Jimin. Sorry, I'm, I don't know if you go by Ben, but I, <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> all right. So before we get started, let me just say this real quick uh, to everybody listening and watching. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you should know beforehand that Maisha and I uh, <laughs> are, are practically joined at the hip. This is someone we're very close. We've been close for decades um one of my best friends in the world so this is going to be a casual way to have this conversation <laughs> casually to talk about this this wonderful book i'm very proud of you i'm very proud of you this wonderful oh, book thank you, Jay. um for those of y'all who showed up i hope that y'all show up with your dollars i'd like to be very honest about this right <laughs> you know what i'm saying i'm glad you're here but i also need you to buy the book harvard benjamin gonna put the link in so you can buy it from harvard bookstore it's cool to be here and support and show love and be interested and curious about what she's talking about. But in order for her to continue to have these conversations, you gotta put money in the pot. That's how this goes, right? Unfortunately, it's brass tax business and we gotta make sure that we keep the voices that we value at the forefront and we do that by putting money in their pockets. All right, and support your local bookstores. All right, my friend, the first question, are you, are, do you have something you wanna say? I have nothing I wanna say. Okay, other than- At like, this moment. Know. You don't want to say, I love you, Jason. It's good to see you. I love, I love you, Jason. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you for joining me, agreeing to do this. I've been looking forward to this all week. Yeah, man. I feel like I feel like we waited our whole lives for this moment. <laughs> look, look at us. Look at us. <laughs> look look at us. 
Hey, yo, yo, you know what's crazy? I was thinking about just a second ago when when he when Benjamin was running down your bio and talking about UC Riverside. You saw that crazy white lady dressed up like a native and indigenous person. Ain't she from, she was in Riverside, California. Listen, listen, listen. But that's not, that's not what, that wasn't at my university. That was in a high school. I know, but them the kind of people who live in Riverside. I just want you to know this. Uh, but, 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 but that ain't at UCR. <laughs> I'll make no claim to that. That just, but that just goes to show our reality. Hence the, 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 the purpose of this book. <laughs> <laughs> the purpose of this book. But I've, I've been looking forward to this all week. So I'm gonna try to be as professional as possible. Come on, man. Don't Remember, do all that. They're not with me, yo. Come I'm gonna on. try. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm gonna try. I didn't say I was gonna succeed. I said I'm gonna try. And Always that's gonna give me a Always good balance. <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna be the good balance. But yeah. I'm I'm not even gonna mention that you need to get an HD camera. This is ridiculous, Jeff. No, you know what it is. What's I, up, what's up? Where, where the 4K at? Where the 4K at? It's a laptop. Your laptop, you using your laptop? I'm using my laptop, but I got a special camera attached to this joint. You need to upgrade. Oh, you got send me then send me the link. I don't know. I, how to I, do all I that. got you. I got you. I got it's you. It's a special camera you put on your laptop. Are you serious? Hey, somebody get some of this, some of this 20 1080 4K action. I'll send you a link. Hey yo, not only are you a philosopher, you a nerd too. I just want to make sure <laughs> you know. All right, let's talk about this. My first question, and I've been thinking about this a lot. I was waiting to see okay. if I could ask you this. All right. So the book is called um. The Case for Rage, Why Anger is Essential to Anti-Racist Struggle. My question, and this is something I've really been thinking about, is there a difference between anger and rage? Both yeah. words are on the cover, mm -hmm. but those words, are they the same word? Are you using them interchangeably? Right. But are they? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so someone might say that that is indeed the case, right? So we're, if we're trying to be like really, really uh, careful with distinctions, there is a difference, right? One might say, well, rage is a more intense, feeling of anger. And one might even often say, and this is usually the, the stereotype, is that rage is a little bit more irrational than anger, right? So it's the, it's the kind of thing that you feel that you feel it much more strongly, but it's also kind of have an impact on your rationality. I'm using, or I decided to use rage in the title for two reasons. First of all, I wanted to be provocative for provocative sake. Um, because I think people have issues with, with anger in general. So no matter what I would have called um, the title of the book, people would still have some kind of feelings about it. And I wanted to get, really get at the heart of that feeling, that, that discomfort that we have um, about anger, about rage, no matter what we call it, right? Um, so in sense, some sense, I'm using it provocatively. But in another sense, I'm using it in the ways in which bell hooks and in the ways in which Cornell West uses the term rage, particularly when they talk about black rage. And it's, it's, it's usually kind of um, the usage is important because if indeed rage is kind of this intense feeling that we have or intense anger that we have towards a certain kind of thing, um, it seems to match the context that I'm concerned about. So if racism is as endemic, is harmful, is killing folk out here in a variety of ways, I mean, th that's a very intense kind of atrocity, then there's emotion that matches that intensity. And we call it we call it rage. So in some sense, yes, I'm being provocative. I want to bother people with the usage of this term, but I'm also using it in the sense that it is a feeling that one is it's not frustration, it's not annoyance, it's this yeah. intense feeling that we feel against uh, racism. So yeah, right. With, so right, with, that, that makes sense. So within this context, then the the conflation of the definitions is is like a, it's something that is uh, it's, it's a passable like you can do it within right. this context because there's no because race because racism the infliction of racism on the on the black on the black body the black psyche uh the anger that is associated with just being frustrated is not what we're dealing with right we're right. talking about right. a much more uh egregious sort of situation that's what's up that makes right. sense for people who are who are who are new to you people who are who have not read the book yet your your you, one of your sort of cornerstones and what you're arguing is the, this idea called Lordian rage. Mm -hmm. And so, just so we can make sure that everybody's up to speed, um, how does one define Lordian rage? Right. So, one of the things I want to say is, and I believe, and this is kind of the motivation behind the book, is that I think that people have a tendency to look at anger as one thing. Um, they usually have a tendency to depict it as, oh, when one is angry, one wants to and act retribution, one wants to engage in revenge, it's always violent, et cetera, et cetera. And if that's, if that's what people feel about anger, of course, you're gonna have problems with it. And I wanna say, no, there's different kinds of anger. Um, 
And there's different kinds of anger, particularly in the racial context that I'm very much concerned with. And so I begin the book kind of talking about these distinctions and I kind of set it up by saying, well, here are all the bad kinds of anger that can arise in the context of injustice. Um, and I wanna say that people have, who have a problem with anger has a problem with those, those types, but there's a different type. There's another type that I wanna, wanna lift up and that's the, that's the kind of anger that I'm making a case for. It's a virtuous kind of anger. I call it's an anti-racist anger. I call it Lordian rage uh, because I'm inspired by Audre Lorde's uses of anger. And so a lot of things that she talked about are uses of anger, the kind of anger that she talks about in that book is the kind of anger that I'm very much concerned with. So Lordian rage or this kind of anti-racist, virtuous anti-racist anger that I'm talking about, it's directed towards racism, racist, racist attitudes, people who engage in or complicit in, in racism, right? That's important. Another thing that kind of makes this anger different from the other types is that it aims for change. To be a little bit more specific, and this is Audre Lorde's word, it aims for a radical transformation of our world, right? So it has a very different, different aim. When one has this particular emotion, they are motivated to engage in, to change their world and, and to change um, structures, to dismantle structures. Um, but also when someone has this rage, the kind of perspective that they have, it's not a selfish perspective, it's not, not a narcissistic perspective. They're thinking about everybody. So it has what I call kind of inclusive perspective. It kind of has, well, Audre Lorde, this kind of notion that I'm not free until all of us are free, right? So it's directed not at sca scapegoats, not at all white people. It's very specific in what it's directed at. Um, it aims for radical transformation of our world. And it's not just connected with black folk getting free, it's connected or concern about everybody getting free. Um, yeah. And that's what I think is distinct from what happened on January the 6th, the anger that they had, the anger that people who marched from Charlottesville had, the anger that a few black elites have that's only concerned about injustice when it, when it affects them. This is, this is virtuous in the sense um, that it's directed at the right folk, it's aiming to do something productive in the world, and it's concerned about everybody getting free. Just for, for context there, she, uh, to me, I find this to be all very brilliant that she, uh, Maisha, um, lays out varieties of rage, right? There's a rogue rage, which is a very specific kind of rage. There's a wipe mm -hmm. rage, which is what we saw with Nazi Germany, right? Mm -hmm. There is, uh, is this word resentiment? Resentiment. Resentment. I don't speak French. Yeah, yeah. Resentment. I don't she speak French. She could have used the English let's translation, pretend. which is resentment. I don't know why she, Maisha, you tried to get A. Hey, no, no, you no, no, wanted no, no. you a new you a new black. That's what you well, acting I like. I don't like French, but I'm a new black. I don't like French, although I like French cinema. But but the reason why I, I, reason why I use it is because in the way in which French speaker Franz Fanon uses it, and the way that Nietzsche also uses it, it has a, it has a, 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 a hey, separate look, for meaning. All of y'all so. listening, when you when you become <laughs> a professional or a professor with a doctorate, you get to just figure out whenever you want to choose to just throw a little French in there. Resentiment Rage. Yes. She's called <laughs> Resentiment Rage. And then, <laughs> and then she got narcissistic rage. And then, mm -hmm. of course, there is uh, Lordy and Rage, which is what this book is primarily about. Let me ask you this. Black folk, you know, our whole lives, so many of us are raised to, and you and I have had this conversation before, you know, we're, we're raised, so many of us are raised to almost believe that that this is a part of ourselves that we're supposed to tamp, right? This is a part of ourselves that we're supposed to uh, sort of sort of siphon off or, or isolate into some sort of psychological silo that we're and to, never to be opened, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, many of us grew up with our, with our grandmamas and our, our OGs saying, oh, count it all joy. No matter what happens, no matter what happens, count it all joy. They never say count it all rage, right? That they never right. like, hey man, they never, it, it, that's never the way that this goes. And so I guess my question is, I mean, it's, which means that what you're doing to me feels revolutionary in many ways. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. guess I, I just want to, um, I guess I just want to ask you like, how, how does one, when I say one, I mean you, how do you decide that like, you know, actually maybe we don't count it all joy. Maybe, maybe mm -hmm. there is a place for this. Right, mm -hmm. because I know I know how you were brought up. I know your background. Like, mm -hmm. how does one decide? Actually, I'm going to choose anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So let's come back to the joy part because I want to say that you can have you can be angry and have, make space for joy. So I want to keep that there. Thank but that's not what we've been taught, right? Um, so I kind of started off the book talking about how I don't remember the first book I read, don't remember my first kiss, but I do remember the first time I was angry. And it was that a racist encounter that I had with a friend of mine when I was seven years old, eight years old. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's emotion that I felt very young. Um, but growing up, I mean, particularly in a Christian household, was taught that, hey, that's not that's that's a, that's a vice. Um, growing up in church, particularly for women, it just wasn't something that was acceptable, right? Um, but wasn't what wasn't talked about was where well, in the Old Testament the prophets were angry, God was angry, Jesus was angry when he, you know, uh, went into the temple and you know tore stuff up, and um, and then people forgot about the scripture about be angry and sin not, right? So they omitted all that other stuff, but it was a culture of, of just being taught that that the anger is just something that we shouldn't feel, and you know I was particularly when when Trayvon Martin was murdered in 2012, I really began to rethink or not even rethink, really take it intellectually serious to try to figure out what is up with this emotion that everyone seems to have a problem with, right? Mm-hmm. Now, I think, I think black folk having a problem with it is very different from white folk having a problem with it, very different from other cultures having a problem with it, right? Um, but I really wanted to figure out why is, what, what is so problematic about anger? And is it any, some, is it something about it uh, that we can uphold? Is it something about it that we can use? Because it has to be something powerful about it. If, if, if the oppressor is telling me not to be angry, then it has to be something potent and powerful about the emotion, right? Um, and I also believe that there's something that we have internalized as, as, as oppressed folk um, about, about the emotion. So I really try to figure out what is it about it? And as I begin to do research, reading Audre Lorde, reading a whole bunch of other feminist philosophers, reading a whole bunch of books, I just realized that it has value. <laughs> um, and, and I guess I can just begin to talk about some of the value that I, that I think it has. And it's not to say that it's a perfect emotion because we are not perfect human beings, so we can do a whole bunch of stuff with it. But this is a reason why I think it has a place in anti-racist struggle. I think one of the things that anger says um, is that it detects that something has gone wrong. Now, if you live in a society of white supremacy, of sexism, um, no one wants to hear that things have gone wrong. So hence, of course, people want to, you to temper your anger, et cetera, et cetera, because anger says something that something has gone wrong and people just don't want to know or accept. I mean, we see this with people's problems with CRT. People don't want to know their, their history and they also don't want to know the facts about their present. But that's what anger does. It makes that proclamation that things, that things are not what they should be. Another thing that that anger does, and mind you, in order for things to change, we have to recognize that things should change and there's something wrong. Another thing that anger does is that it affirms the value of lives, right? Um, If if you don't value anything, then when that thing is mistreated, you won't get angry about it, right? Um, If I was to come to your house right now and cut up that leather, leather, nice leather coat, uh, sofa you got in there, break down all those... uh, I'm not even gonna talk about how expensive those original uh, <laughs> photography pieces and all that art you got in your house, which is nobody's business, but I know how much it costs. But you're telling everybody, but you're yeah, gonna tell everybody, I'm just, right? I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just saying, I didn't tell people where you live though. I didn't tell anybody where you live, but you, you'll be upset with me. Why would you be upset with me, right? Why would you be upset? Because that has value, right? You re- usually respond with anger to that thing that has value. And I would know, right, that, that, that you value it by your anger. So there's something about anger that says, um, that if you mistreat a certain group of people, I'm going to respond with anger. And by doing that, I'm saying their lives matter. We're in a world of white supremacy, uh, where white people are supreme. Who wants to hear, hear that, right? Um, but another thing that anger does, it motivates us to engage in productive action to transform our world. Um, it, it's also an emotion that resists white supremacy. So it has this, this, this value. And what I want to do in this book is to say, yes, I know what we've been taught. <laughs> I know about the stereotypes that we don't want to confirm, which I think is a strategy to keep us silent. I know all about that stuff, but there's value in this particular emotion, particularly in, in, in fighting against racist structures in a racist society. And we can use it for productive means, despite what we've been told. I mean, it's no different than like, you know, pain, right? Pain in the body, right? If mm-hmm. I have pain in the body, it means something is wrong. Right. right? And so this is almost like a transmutation of what that would be if it's pain in the body politic. Right. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like if, if there's anger, if there's pain, there's anger. Right. right. Some, something is that this is a signal that something is the matter. Right. Something is right. wrong. Uh, right. I, it's super interesting. I, you know, the last time I saw you a few weeks ago, we were talking about um, forgiveness. And I know this is a it's technically a separate a separate sort of tributary. Right. But I, 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 I do think it's interesting to think about can one be rageful and forgiving? And is that and is it even necessary to you? Mm-hmm. Now it's interesting because when I began to do research on 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 anger, 
I came about it through forgiveness, right? Um, because I was hearing people, hey, forgive. Why can't these black posts just forgive, forgive? And I was trying to figure out, so this, what do they mean by forgiveness? And one of the most popular accounts, I mean, we know this, is the letting go of anger. So people can, you know, usually people's responses when you say, hey, what, what does it mean to forgive? Oh, I'm not angry anymore. I let it, I let it go and that it is supposed to be, to be anger. Mm-hmm. Um, I also resist that definition. Um, I think that could be right in certain, some circumstances. But I think it's possible to forgive without letting go of anger, because I think there's just a variety of things that we can do that can count as forgiveness, right? Um, so it could be the case that I forgive you, not by letting go of anger, because perhaps I wasn't angry in the first place. I may forgive you by deciding not to not to commit revenge, or I may uh, forgive you by not allowing your past actions to determine, in my mind, who you actually are. I may forgive you by letting go of the hatred that I have in my heart. I mean, there's a variety, I think, of moral things that we can do that will count as forgiveness so that we can achieve a kind of repair between our relationship or reconciliation, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a very broad understanding, just as I have a, I have a broad view of anger, right? There's the variety of angers. I also have a broad view of forgiveness to suggest that there's, a, there's a, several practices or several things that we can do that can count as, as forgiveness. With that in mind, I, it's possible to forgive and, and keep your anger. Hmm. Hmm. that's possible I don't I don't see a conflict in that um I I, I don't um and it also doesn't mean that as a result it goes back to the people's concern about violence it also doesn't mean um that as a result of that me holding on to that anger that I'm gonna burn shit down I mean that doesn't necessarily mean that either but it's it's possible to, to forgive I no longer hate you but when I think about you every now and again that anger may arise because the wrongdoing was so intense Um, But I think it's possible to forgive and still hold on to your anger. You know, one of the things that I think you do so well in the book, and I I guess this is just what the philosophers do, you know, it's like you build it. (laughs) So just so all all y'all who are watching, my my biggest joke with Maisha is that she's a philosopher. First of all, I've known her when she wasn't a philosopher. So I, you know. I know, I, know, body, I know you before I know you were a novelist. A very, I know, I know, I know what a body is. I know you very. before you were novelist when you were just spitting poetry on the exactly, mic. Exactly, exactly. I know. I remember when you was a musician and when you, L. <laughs> Listen, I know where all the bodies are buried. So, so our biggest joke is sort of, for me, it's always a trip just to see her as she sort of stomps through the world as a giant in this, in this field. I think um, one thing that you do so well, though, in the book that I was so happy and really just interested in is that you create this, this brilliant argument, but then you also say, ah, but there are times where anger gets in the way. Mm-hmm. And this was something I thought it was like, ah, cause I, cause I, you know, cause for me, you know, I'm the type of guy who reads something and be like, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and just get angry. Oh, what's anger time? <laughs> oh, what's that? <laughs> oh, hey, my people's told me that rage is the way. I mean, I, I'm in rage, right, do you right, know? Right, right. right. But, you, but there's a moment where you say, there's, there's a whole section where you say, when rage gets in the way of positive action. And you break down all these different things, right? Like, or, 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 and not only do you break down these things, but you also break down the arguments that other people come up with. Right, right, right. To, to, to discourage us from being angry. Right, right. right. Like, oh, it, you know, like deterring potential allies or, right. or there's another one you have in here that, uh, deterring the powerful, swapping mm-hmm. them. There's all this stuff. And I just want you to talk a bit about that section. Mm-hmm. I think it's, I think it's nuanced in a way that, uh, sometimes we don't often give ourselves, you know, um, uh, an opportunity to sort of have, you know. Right, right. So although I'm making this case, I mean, I don't believe in anything being utopian, right? I don't believe that um, things always go right, right? Um, That just doesn't happen. I wish it did. Um, Particularly when it has to do as human beings, things can just go awry. Even when we have the perfect tool, things can go awry, right? And so I want to make space for that to say that although I'm saying there's a case to be made for this emotion, we still need to be careful, right? Um, and so I have a chapter, uh, chapter five of the book kind of talks about what I call rage renegade. And I talk about that even when white folk have what I'm calling loading and rage, there's still some mistakes that they can make, right? That can reinforce white supremacy. Here are some mistakes that you can make. Watch out for that, right? And then I end the book kind of talking about anger management. They say, hey, even though it's, you know, loading and rage is virtuous, right? Here are some things that you should be actively doing to make sure that you don't get slack with it to make sure that you don't get uh, reckless with it, right? So here's some anger management techniques. In this particular chapter that you're referring to, I'm very much concerned with what people may say about, yes, Maisha, I'm convinced by your argument, but still, if people are angry, then it's possible, it's impossible, that's gonna turn people off from joining the cause, right? Right. And and, and I I think that's that's a wonderful objection. 
Um, but I, I turn the focus on its heel, right? I simply suggest, as opposed to saying that oppressed folk and their allies ought to change their emotions because some people are turned off by it. Let's ask why are people turned off by it? And perhaps if they're turned off by it, maybe they're not yet ready to be an ally, right? Mm -hmm. And I also suggest that if we're so concerned about anger, the, this particular emotion turning people off, I wanna remind, remind people that Martin Luther King Jr. in the civil rights movement had a love ethic. And let me tell you something, that turned a lot of people off. So if love turned people off, <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to concede the point that anger is going to turn people off, but yeah. that still doesn't give me kind of these reasons now to not have this particular emotion, right? And I want to say that if, if, if emotions are turning potential allies off, they need to do a kind of work to try to figure out what is their problem? Why is it turning them off? There's a, there's a line from Audre Lorde, Jesus of Anger, for the first couple of pages, where she talks about how she gave a speech and a white feminist comes to her and she says, tell me how you feel, but don't say it too loudly or I cannot hear you. And Audre Lorde says, well, is it what I'm saying or is it you? Is it the fact that you need to change in order to listen to what I have to say? So I'm basically like borrowing that kind of interrogation and saying, hey, yes, it's no doubt some people may be turned off, but they need to ask themselves why they be being turned off instead of putting all the onus on the, on the oppressed. Another thing I talk about, another objection that I say, people may say, well, if you're so angry, and you, know, you wanna use your anger anger to get the powers that be to kind of transform their ways. But if you're so angry, they're not gonna be able to hear you. I get it, I totally understand. Uh, but I'll also say that please don't be deceived. Anger, as much as it's being used to protest and to communicate to oppressors, that's not what it's all for. There's another audience that anger is for. Um, and in an example of this, last summer, last summer, yes, 2020, last summer, um, when there were protests, not just in the United States, but also around the world. And I saw people marching solidarity with Black lives. And I saw people being angry that never came to the United States, but they were in solidarity with us. You know what their anger did to me? Their anger made me feel like us Americans, we're not imagining things. It made me feel affirmed because that's the kind of work that anger is also doing. It's not just sending a message to the oppressed, but it's also sending a message to the oppressor that if anybody messes with you, Jay, and if you see that I'm angry, that tells you that I love you. It tells you that I care for you. It tells you that I have your back. And anger is not just communicating a message to the oppressed. It's also communicating a message to the, to the, to the oppressor. It's, not, it's also communicating a message to the oppressed. So even if the oppressed doesn't hear us, the anger is still speaking to us. And that should matter too. Does it ever concern, does performative anger concern you? Yeah. Like I think about I think about this I think about this with a few I've been thinking about this a lot lately because it probably doesn't mm -hmm. happen. So like let's say Lordy and Rage right this brilliant idea uh, becomes a household term, mm -hmm. right? White folks are like I got Lordy and Rage, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I went out there and I marched with George Floyd though I have zero self interest. I got Lordy and Rage, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody got to see me out there. Uh, do you ever, like, that becomes a very slippery thing. I feel the same right. way, by the way. I feel the same way, by the way, about when ta did the whole, like, you know, people who identify as white, right? Or, mm -hmm. or like, they, like, when he really, when he and others broke down the idea that, like, whiteness isn't actually, uh, like, white people, like, it, it's, it, the, it, elevating the idea of the construct, of the social construct and saying, like, look, mm -hmm. man, you, you are socially identified as white, but that's not really a thing. And my, my fear is always a white person saying, I'm actually not white. Right. Right. right? right. So like right. all of, all that, all that, all that stuff you talking, all that stuff. Glad you, glad you, glad you made that mistake first. <laughs> I almost did. Actually, you already did it, by the way. You cursed in the last, yeah. you did. Don't worry about it. Okay, um, all right. You did though. So you okay. got your little first, but you know, like, like I'm not actually white. And so all of that stuff that you're talking about white people doesn't actually pertain to me. Right. Right. right? right. So like, does, does, does that scare you? Cause it always scares me. Does that scare you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I, I anticipate it. Right. And that's, that's one of the ways in which I, I say that it can go awry. And one of the things that we need to be very careful at. Right. Um, you know, cause, because in some ways, one of the things that I say that the reason why this kind of rage is valuable is that it motivates us to engage in productive action, right? You know your lording and rage is going awry. Well, you're not using it to engage in productive action. You're using it to engage in performative action. 
Um, and, and one of the things I suggest is that's why, that's why it's important to be in solidarity with others, to have people that's gonna hold you account. So they can point it out when you begin to do the kind of performative stuff that I, that I suggest. Um, but I'm very much, I mean, I, 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 I saw it in, one might say, I saw it in the protest last, last summer, right? Um, people just going to protest just for catharsis or going to protest just to get it out. And I'm talking about white folk, particularly going to protest, just say, hell, I got that out. And then they go back home and act like nothing ever happened. So that's always a, a, a worry. But one of the things that I say is that when you do that, that's an indication that your rage is going to arrive and you're not really taking full advantage of the features of the productive and motivational features. Um, so there's no doubt that's going to happen. Hopefully that person will recognize when it happened or they have people in solidarity with them that can remind them that that happened and then they can get on track. Because what they're doing is if, like I said, if rage is used to motivate us to do productive action, but instead the only productive action that you're doing it is doing it to, here's some examples we haven't talked about, to front as if you are like the perfect white person. So you're not, it's not just that you're just using it for catharsis, but you're using it to promote some image about oneself. You're using it to redeem whiteness, all these other things that you can do. I wanna remind people, hey, hey, these are some mistake. You're making a mistake. Come back, come back with it. W what is your rage doing? How is it making the world better? How is it being productive? Um, so yes, it can go awry, but it's not just rage that can go awry. Love can go awry. Um, compassion can go awry. Whole bunch of emotions can go awry. And I just wanna remind people that this is how it can happen. You know what's happening when this happens and here's some ways to get back on track. I want to remind everybody, please put your questions in the Q&A. We're going to get to them in just a second. Um, please, if you have any questions, hit the Q&A tab. Um, let me ask you a, a trick like a trick question. Uh, <laughs> not, not like a bad I'll wait like, in. I'll wait in. Okay. No, it's, not, it's nothing wow. I, I just, I lord, the, the, the Lordian rage is, I just think it's so brilliant. So if you were going to come up with a concept for joy, mm. who would, what, who who would it be rooted in? Right. So I'm gonna, or I'm gonna. Or forgiveness, or forgiveness, either. Right, right. So I'm gonna steal, I'm gonna steal this from a black colleague, which is basically just lifting her work up because she just came out with a book on the politics of black joy. Mm -hmm. um, and what she's using, and you'll like this, she's um, using Joy Neal Hurston. Um, oh, snap. As, a, as an exemplar, as a model of what, what joy, what black joy can look like. Um, and she's using her because she simply suggests that um, Southern life, and she's very much concerned with this context, Southern life, people think that Black folk is just preoccupied with white folk in Southern life, but don't know that Black people have a whole life outside of white folk, yeah. and they are enjoying, enjoying life. Um, so that's easy for me. I just leave people to uh, uh, Lindsay Stewart's work <laughs> on the policies of Black joy and just using Zora as, a, as an exemplar of, of that, that despite what's going on in the white world, and this is kind of like what Tony was also trying to say. Hey, there's a life that exists outside of that. And it's also a life of joy. Um, Herstonian, Herstonian joy. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's yep. dope, yeah. That's dope. Hey, you about to see white folk wearing t-shirts like I don't know. Woody and Rage. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to belabor the questions. Let's get to it. I got one more question that I asked at the end. But uh, let's see, see what we got. Um, Okay, Holman Lozano, you might know some of these people, so I'm gonna say their names. Holman Lozano asks, has, has the way we understand anger changed from Aristotle to today? If yes, what are, the, what are the consequences of that change? If not, why do you think so? Yeah, so Aristotle is interesting, right? Because um, you can use his work to kind of make the case that I'm making, right? One of the things that Aristotle says, um, well, Virtuous anger, you gotta be angry at the right thing, at the right time, right? So he's basically, you know, reading that, you'd be like, oh, okay, okay, so I can have any anger. I just gotta make sure that it's on point. And then you can also read Aristotle, and Aristotle may describe anger as, uh, you know, a desire for revenge, right? So you might think, oh, he doesn't want us to, to be angry. And then you can read another piece of Aristotle um, that simply says that a person who doesn't get angry is a fool. Right, as it suggests that you're lacking in self-respect if you don't get angry if someone is mistreating you. So you can you can pull from a, a variety of, of aspects of Aristotle to support your view. There's an author, a philosopher by the name of Martha Nussbaum, who uses Aristotle to make a case against anger. And she uses Aristotle by suggesting, and mind you, this book came out, I think in 2016, um, by my publishers. Um, and basically she makes, she simply says, hey, like Aristotle, 
what it means to be angry is to have a desire and a lust for revenge. Um, that's what it is to be angry. And so therefore we shouldn't um, use this emotion. Instead, if we're angry, we sh should transition to more positive emotions such as generosity and love. So even, you know, I'm looking at her work as much as the Aristotle strand was millennia ago, there's still philosophers inspired by an aspect of his thinking that suggests that anger is a bad thing um, and that it's not useful and it's going to lead to vengeance so we shouldn't have it. Um, but I read Aristotle differently. And I, I, I look at Aristotle's work um, and say, he helps me make a case for the kind of rage that I'm referring to. Do you think that there's a human emotion that's bad? <laughs> I like this question. I like this question. Yeah. No. Me no. neither. I Martha Nussbaum. What is it? Is... <laughs> because even, even if we think about hate, for example, well, I need to know what, you, what, you, what the hate is directed to. Is it a hatred for injustice? Right? Is it a hatred for evil? Right? Is it a hatred for vice? Right? So, so and, and that's why this brings me, brings me back to something that I haven't talked about, that even when I make the distinctions between anger, I basically say that the anger, what makes the anger good or bad is going to depend on who is it directed at? What is one motivated to do when one feels this particular emotion? And who is one thinking about? Um, in, the in, in the end game. Um, and that's gonna help us determine if it's bad or good. So in my whole view about emotions, I, I need for people to tell me a little bit more. Who do you love? What, what is the love directed at, right? Is it directed towards black people? Is it directed at crack cocaine? I mean, that's gonna make a, 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 a that's gonna be important for us to kind of distinguish if the love is good or not. Um, so, you know, until someone says more about a particular emotion, I'm gonna say it's a virtue. Yeah, all human emotion is human. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, Yukari Matsuyama, who is someone that I know, uh, says, this is not a question, but I want to thank you for saying that there is value to anger and rage and the feelings behind it. As an Asian woman in a white supremacist society, I think we're often seen as not even having anger right. or rage or that will turn the other cheek to what's done to us. Thank you for confirming that I can hold those feelings and let it show and to use it for something productive. Right, right. I mean, as much as I talked about the stereotype, you know, of the uh, uh, angry black woman, which to me is a stereotype in order to get black women not to be angry because we are a force when we are. I think the same thing can happen in the converse, right? In but, which there's stereotypes of Asian Americans being docile, passive. Um, <laughs> passive. And so we have a tendency to kind of want to give in, just, you know, satisfy. And I think that's, that's also used to keep Asian Americans tempered and relaxed. Um, and so I'm grateful for the question. I'm, I'm glad you, you are now considering the value of it. Transgress against it, resist against it. If you are angry, don't be shameful of your, of your anger. You fit to have a whole bunch of Asian people walking around slapping the shit out of people. <laughs> and I'm just, just joking. <laughs> See, see, see you, you're making, you're making um, violence synonymous with anger. Resist that, Jason. Resist that. I'm just joking. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for all of the scholars on here, I'm sure this is such a disappointment to your normal scholarship and your scholarly discussions. But that ain't really what we came for. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so the whole Harvard crew, I apologize. But, you know, she asked me to do this. You know what I mean? Be mad at her. Your rage, take it toward my issue. <laughs> next, <laughs> next question is from Takunda Matos. Please forgive me if I'm butchering names. I apologize. Takunda Matos. Um, thank you so much for your contribution to this discourse. Can you say something about the conditions that allow the recipient to properly register anger? In particular, I'm wondering if you can address the tension between someone who is expressing anger's claim to moral equality and the failure or refusal of the white people to register not just the anger, but the moral equality of people expressing the anger. Right, right. I like this. I like this. That's a smart so, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like this. So there's two audiences that I have in, uh, two audiences that I have in mind and, and when, when writing a book. I wanted to write a love letter to the outrage to let them know that they have nothing to be ashamed of and giving them some strategies and some tools and how to make use of their anger. Another group that I want to uh, respond to or write this book for, is for those who just seem to have a problem with anger. Um, and what you're discovering in the book, that particularly the context that I'm concerned about in the anti-racist context, that usually it's not just that people have a problem with the anger, people have a problem with the people who are angry. 
And I wanted people to kind of confront what the real issue is, whatever the issue is, to confront what the real issue is, wrestle with the real issue, so that criticism will, will, will lessen. There's no doubt that I think that, um, and I spent some time, I think this is probably chapter four of the book, when I talk about how there's a connection between, and I'm answering this a long way around, there's a connection between value, respect, and anger. And I think I alluded to this when I talked about your very expensive art in your house, that, that when you value something, you're gonna think that that thing ought to be respected or that person ought to be respected. And when that person is not respected, then you're going to respond with, with anger. And we see this in relationship to white men. I think about the uh, most recent cases, Brett Kavanaugh, um, that if he thinks you know, he's valuable and he has certain kinds of entitlements, and if there's a barrier to that kind of particular entitlement that can be translated to disrespect, then when he responds, he's free to respond to anger in ways in which Bozzi Ford was not able to, because there's a connection to value, respect, and anger. And I take it to be the case, and later on in that chapter, I talk about Darren uh, Wilson, Officer Darren Wilson's encounter with Michael Brown. And in his, um, in his description of the events, he describes that uh, he was confused about why Michael Brown was getting angry that he was shooting him, right? And I think that you can be confused about that particular encounter when the person that you're shooting at doesn't have any value. If you don't think they have value, they don't think they're entitled to any kind of respect. And you also will not think um, that they deserve any kind of anger in response to you failing to shoot them. So I would say that the person who has a problem understanding what that anger is, is communicating. I think what that indicates or what that signifies is that person just doesn't respect the value of your particular life um, if they don't understand your anger. I think there's a very deep uh, connection there. Um, and the anger is reminding them that you're just not the one. <laughs> um, and so I, I just hope that my book will help people contend with those underlying issues, uh, that the problem is not the anger, but the people who have the anger and that they can also wrestle with their racist assumptions and racist views in relationship to the anger of the outrage. Mm, that makes sense. That's, that's word. Um, this is an anonymous attendee, but I love this question. And it gets to something that we brought up a little bit earlier about our upbringing and everything and how okay. culturally, but I, it's such a good one. Um, I am particularly attracted to the premise of your argument because I find two expected, accepted reactions to racism, especially in the academy, very problematic. I am assumed to be hurt or even offended which forces me, which forces me to explain that racists don't have that power, that that much power over me. Is mm -hmm. anger a solution, or is it equally problematic in its respect? This is such an interesting question because this is what we always hear: don't let them have that much power. If you get upset right. with them, then they got power. Then, then it proves they got power over you. Right, 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 right. So there's several ways that we can address this, right? And one way that's a psychological tool. In some ways it keeps us sane, but it's also a strategy game, right? Because remember, you know, like you said, um, well, if you show them that you are upset, it shows them that you have, I mean, that's a, that's a very, that's a strategy that's implemented in a game. Um, here's the thing, I'm just realizing, particularly seeing the lives that we've lost over COVID that has nothing to really do with medical stuff, but also social economic background and racial background and such and such. And I think about people who constantly are being killed in these streets and just racial inequality and housing issues that very much racial, this is not a game. And I'm not down for playing those games anymore, right? Things are not gonna change until we call them out, right? And there are people who are not just hurt or offended, there are people who are dying. And my anger is a response to that death, not my anger is a response, not to the power that I think these people have, right? But it's to the value of the people that I love and the power that I think we all have to transform our, our particular society. Um, I understand the, psych the psychological strategies that we use to survive. I understand the kind of community game that we have to engage in, but I'm just not down for that game anymore. It's time for us to really get real about changing our world, transforming our world, and it has to start with us communicating how we feel and being honest about that feeling and doing something in response to that feeling. Mm, body that, you body that. <laughs> <laughs> body that one. Hey, I wanna, I, I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna jump around a little bit with the questions because there is a question I really wanna ask for my own edification, but also, cause it's my guy. Shout out to my guy Jabari, my homie Jabari in here. He has, he's a- uh, 
Oh, you know, it's right. I got you, Jabari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he said Harvard alum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Jabari, man. Um, and you know, Jabari works in, you know, in, in the K through 12 space uh, as a school teacher, uh, doing such such wonderful work for black babies and 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 also attempting some revolutionary methods. And so he's he's asking what forms might a productive rage, specifically Lordian rage, take in a K through 12 classroom? Mm, in the classroom. Question. Let's go, Jabari. That's a good question. Jabari, I, I wish I could hear your voice because I, I want you to tell me a little bit more, right? I, I, I'm, I'm wondering and curious about um, the kind of space that you're, that you're imagining, right? So you're imagining, oh, there's a conflict in class. Um, it's a racist, a very explicit racist conflict. And you have kids responding with, with anger and you want to you you ask, what would a, a lording in response look like in that particular context? Or are we thinking about thinking about something else? And I'm hoping Jabari is kind of responding as I'm, as I'm. Uh, we'll come back, Jabari. Jabari. If you're here, Jabari, respond to that, and then we'll come. Yeah, back. just give me some clarity, because particularly you, you asking for practical kind of uh, imaginative kind of conceptual stuff that you may implement. I want to be very, very, very careful um, that I understand the context. So, so Jabari, just care, clarify that for me, and and I answer. All right. So from uh, Christine Brown says. The performative anger happens when true change isn't ready to be accepted. Anti-blackness is deeply rooted within white folks and is going to take more attending, more, th more than attending a protest to fully interrogate that. How do we demonstrate the full complexity of our humanity? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have a direct answer to that question. Um, I mean, I would say, and there's something um, that was embedded in that question that made me think about this thought, and I don't know if this would be satisfactory, but I'm thinking about there, there may be an assumption that what I'm arguing about, or at least the productive space that I'm thinking about is a protest, as to suggest that anger only has utility in that particular context in the Black Lives Matter protest. And I wanna say, I just wanna remind people that the case that I'm making, or even to be clear about the kind of space of anti-racist struggle just don't happen in the street. Anti-racist struggle happens in our private spaces. It happens in our psychological minds. It happens in our interactions with our friends and our loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I think about making a case for rage, I'm not just talking about using rage um, to engage in a protest, um, but I'm also thinking about ways, and, and maybe this perhaps would answer that latter question, um, about ways, what do you do when there's no oppressor around or there's no other protesters around? How can rage still do the, the kinds of things that I'm, I'm referring to? And I wanna say that there is, even when no one's watching, the kind of rules that you can break, and I call these racial rules in the, in the book, yeah, I don't I have time to really go into of... it, um, but even by yourself, you can be in a resistance figure simply by acknowledging that you're angry at racial oppression. I kind of lay out why that's the case. And that's a way to kind of maintain your dignity um, that you don't have to declare, you don't have to give them the news about it. You don't have to allow you know, white folk to listen to you, um, but just by yourself, you can be a resistance figure with your rage. And that can be a way uh, to maintain your, your, your dignity, and dignity in such a society. I also want to clarify something that, you know, the case that I'm making is not a case for black rage. Black rage can fall under the umbrella but I'm talking about rage that anybody has, that black folks have, that people of color have, that white allies have in response in response to racism. Um, and so as much as this can be helpful to black folk, it's, it's, it's inclusive, it's, it's a rage of anybody who is frustrated, irritated and outraged at what's happening in our, in our society. And that is what makes it specifically Lordy and rage. Yes, yes. So, but, so Holman Lozano, to answer your question, that's what makes it, because the next question is, well, what makes it Lordy? And that, that's what makes it, that's what specifies it. Yeah, yeah. That uh, inclusive aspect, yes. What is your response to Alabama refusing to teach critical race theory, saying they don't want to encourage, saying, saying they don't want to encourage basically this very rage right. that we speak of? Right, right. Well, what I've been hearing is that they don't want to, they won't want to, I don't know how many of y'all have seen the Colin Lisa Rice view oh, excerpt. Have. And it seems to be an overwhelming concern about history hurting the feelings of white folk, of white students. And we know that we have entered a space in which we live in a world of white supremacy. And I don't wanna really isolate Colin Lisa Rice because I think a lot of people are articulating that. 
when the concern becomes white feelings mm -hmm. over black and brown lives. Right? We, we know we have entered a dilemma in which, I mean, it was articulated as if this should be the acceptable thing. You know, don't tell the history because it's gonna hurt white people's feelings. Not that it's gonna kill, but continue to kill black folks. Not that it's gonna continue to allow those same feelings to turn to hate and with, in ways in which they can enact action that had a lot to do with what the actions that happened on January 6th. Let's not be concerned about that. Let's just be concerned about white feelings. And, and the feelings are feelings of guilt and shame, um, which I don't know a lot of white people who feel guilt and shame about being white. I do know a lot of black folk, a lot of brown folk that feel a lot of guilt, uh, feel a, little, a lot of shame, feel a lot of inferiority um, in, re in relationship to being who they are because they live in a white supremacist society. And it's just a reminder, um, and this is what I'm trying to do in this book, is to center the emotions of people who really care about justice and not center the emotions of people who are scared to be reminded about the realities in which we live. So my response to what's happening um, is, let me get my professional response. <laughs> um, is it some, um, just a reminder, um, all the more that we need to teach the truth we need to teach the history and the present. And we need to be concerned, not just about the emotions of the privileged, but the emotions of the oppressed and their allies. So Jabari is back and he says, uh, and then I'm gonna ask the final question. Jabari back, he says, I'm thinking about making a space for students' rage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their rage at racist moments in the classroom by peers or teachers, but also by admin via curricula. Right, 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 right. I think one way, Jabari, and perhaps we can talk about this offline a little bit, to kind of do the kind of work that I'm challenging people to do in the first chapter, to get students to say, hey, who, who's, your, who's your rage directed at? What you want to do with it? Who are you thinking about with it, right? So really asking those kinds of questions. Um, in, in the other space, we call this kind of doing kind of emotional intelligence work. Um, and I don't know, Jabari, I mean, I know you're familiar with this. I don't know how that has been received in educational spaces. I know it's been received in business spaces, but particularly when you're dealing with children, we need to take wrestling with, talking about, um, trying to get a handle of, and also listening to the emotions of young people. And if we don't do that now, we're gonna face people who have stunted emotions, who have suppressed emotions that end up doing some crazy stuff when they get the twos of age to do with it, right? Um, I don't know how that can play out, but I think most definitely Jabari, emotional intelligence work needs to be done in the classroom. Um, and I think that kind of work would lead us to developing um, healthy um, emotions in the classroom. And an example of that is being low, is loading up age. Jabari, I think that you're one of the guys who, who perhaps with this kind of information can suss that out, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And kind of build mm -hmm. that infrastructure for for how do we teach young people to express rage in the classroom man? and i'm sure you know we you got it champ you know what i mean you got it um my last question my issue i'm going to close it out with this i ask everybody this everybody that i do these sort of uh, book talks with um from you know ranging from james mcbride to crystal fleming to i mean everybody anybody i do this with has the same question so think about this book and what you've made you know and then think about your 10 year old self Right, Maisha at 10 years old, and I think we've talked about this, you know, like your 10 year old So, what would you think 10 year old Maisha for? What grade was that in 10th grade? Probably like the fourth or the fifth. And so, how would I think that 10 year old? What would you think that 10 year old for? Mm. Right, mm -hmm. we're, we're all products of that. That 10 year old is who you right, are. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. right. So when I think about being 10, I was in Miss Yarbrough's class, fifth grade, Norview Elementary School. And that 10 year old had a sense of purpose that early in her, in her life. Um, and Miss Yarbrough was also a teacher, constantly challenged her to live up to that kind of aspiration, that kind of purpose. Um, and so one of the things that I would think that 10 year old, I mean, it's hard to think that 10 year old would also think in that community in which that 10 year old was living in. Absolutely. Um, but that sense of purpose that she had and the sense of 
or feeling that that purpose was being nurtured um, has a lot to do with what I am today. Yeah. Um, so I would thank that 10 year old, but also thank that community of teachers, um, community of pastors and ministers and people that was around that, that took notice of that, that specialness and nurtured it. Um, Cause it haven't gone away. I still have it. So. Word up. Shout out to Ms. Yabra. Ms. Yabra. Maisha, I love you. I love you too. That's why I'm gonna get you to this link so you can get this 4K camera. Cause this is ridiculous. I can barely see you. I gotta take my glasses off. It's so blurry. Whatever, yo. I'm just proud of is you. That 720? Is that 780? Can we is talk? Can we, can we close out? Can okay, we close sorry, out? Sorry. Can, can I yes, have a yes. moment to tell you how much I love you and appreciate yes. your work? Can I? Yes, yes. I love yes, you. you. I'm grateful that you're in the world. I'm glad this book is in the world. I think it's going to set a lot of us free. You know what I mean? Oh, I think a lot of us are. Yeah, man. And, and uh, yeah, and no, none of your other talks are going to be this fun. So, like, I hope <laughs> you had a good time. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I did. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you both for this fantastic conversation. It was simply the best. Thank you for sharing your brilliance and your light with us today. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. Please learn more about this incredible book and purchase The Case for Rage at harvard.com. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore and our co-sponsors at the Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics, both here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy your weekend, keep reading, thank your inner 10-year-olds, and stay safe. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us today.